Since the Republican race to choose a presidential candidate began more than three months ago, African Americans have largely stayed out of the process. We ask, why can't the Republican Party gain more support from black voters? You're watching Inside Story US 2012 from Washington. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu. In the southern U.S. state of Mississippi, nearly 40% of the population is black, the largest in the country. But during the state's March 13th Republican primary, only 2% of the voters were African Americans. And it was a similar picture through other Republican contests. For years, Republican leaders have said they would work hard to increase African American support for their party, but so far, those efforts appear to be a failure. When asked during an interview, why is the Republican Party poison for so many African Americans, the only black candidate to run for the 2012 Republican ticket, Herman Cain, said it was because, quote, they have been brainwashed into not being open-minded, not even considering a conservative point of view. A documentary titled Fear of a Black Republican was just released here in Washington, D.C. It posed a similar question. Let's take a look. Party really wants more African Americans. The Republican Party wants to stay in power. They would solicit Martians to do so. They would solicit Negroes too. We are going to do everything we can, every day, night and day, to reach out and earn the votes of the African American community all over this country. We African Americans, after the Civil War, just dealt with one party. After the great FDR, we went to the other party. My great-grandfather was a Democrat. My grandfather was a Democrat. And I think on my birth certificate, it had, you know, Negro, Democrat. You're black, you're Democrat. Democratic Party wants to gain power. They would solicit Martians and try to keep their Negroes. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. They don't need you. They can do it all on their own. They got all the votes. Well, when you first proposed the idea of going into the African American communities and campaigning seriously, what was the reaction you received from your advisors or the party structure? That was a waste of time. So why hasn't the Republican Party been successful in reaching out to black voters? It's a party that has also been losing the support of Hispanic voters. To discuss all that and more, we're joined from Philadelphia by James Braxton Peterson. He's director of Africana Studies at Lehigh University. And in the studio with us, we have Anna Navarro, national Hispanic co-chair for both John McCain and John Huntsman, and Kevin Williams, the director of the film Fear of a Black Republican. Now, among the speakers at the Washington screening of Kevin Williams' film was Michael Steele, the former chairman of the Republican National Committee. We asked him, why should African Americans support Republicans? Well, I can't say why they should until we give them a reason. So, uh, you just, if you start with the assumption that they should because we're, quote, conservative, or what I love to hear is, well, you know, they're conservative like us. Well, what does that mean? Uh, everyone defines it differently for themselves. The approach has got to be uh, before you can answer the question, why shouldn't they support us, or, or anything like that, is what are you doing to get them to support you? You know, what steps are you actively, proactively taking to make sure that this community of people that was part of the founding of your party, by the way, a little guy called Frederick Douglass, and a whole host of other black abolitionists and others who were very much a part of this, uh, building and founding of the party, what what are you doing to tie back to that, that energy, those issues that were uh, important uh, to the black community, whether it was civil rights, whether it was uh, economic rights, whether it was empowerment issues? Okay, let's go to the panel. Kevin, let me start with you. Uh, you made the movie. Why does the Republican Party have such a problem attracting black voters? Well, the primary problem is really outreach. Uh, there aren't any efforts or many efforts around the country. Uh, you go from district to district, state from state, 
and there's a huge disconnect between what people say at the upper levels of the party that we want to attract African American voters, uh, we want to attract people from urban areas, and then what actually goes on on the ground. There's very little, if any, money or resources to get the party in the cities, even do literature drops, knock on doors, meet voters, let alone actually support candidates who are running in their home districts. So you think there's not enough resources because what you have is finite, it's being used to attract white voters? Very much so. Uh, as Grover Norquist even says in her film, is it better to go where you can win 20 votes or go where you can win 200 votes? And the mathematics would tell them they should go where it is the 20 votes, excuse me, the 200 votes and go after that because there's only so much budget they have to go after voters. But what happens over time is they're not building the party and they're going to start shrinking their voter base very soon. Right, okay. Let's look at the 2012 primaries. Now, in the 2012 Republican primaries in the United States, black voters have hardly been seen at the polls. As we mentioned earlier, Mississippi is the state with the highest black population, but only 2% of those at the primary polls were African American. In Alabama, also just 2% uh, of primary voters were black, despite their overall population of 26%. And just 1% of the primary voters in South Carolina were black, even though they make up 28% of the state's population. Let's bring in James Peterson out there in Philadelphia. James, this was not always the case. There's been a sea change. I mean, if we look at party support in the earlier part of the 20th century, it was the Republicans that had all the black support and the Democrats who was seen as the party of segregation and the party of discrimination. That's right. So the values and issues of the, of the parties have been exchanged, essentially. You know, you had Republicans. Uh, Lincoln was a Republican president. Obviously, the abolition of slavery was an important issue. Reconstruction policies and certain issues were really, really important for the Republican Party. And the Democratic Party housed the most, race, the most racial and racist uh, constituencies of the American voting populace. Over time, those things have actually switched around. You'd never see a Democrat uh, moving or voting for states' rights. That's a Republican ideal now. <clears throat> and sadly, uh, the majority of the racists that are still remaining in this country, uh, many of them would identify as being Republican. And so there's been an issues and values exchanged between the two parties over the course of the, of the last century and a half or so. And that's why you have that what looks like a switcheroo. Right. Anna Navarro, I mean, the uh, Republican Party is not just using black votes. They're also losing the Hispanic vote. I mean, the Republicans have tried to make an effort to get the Hispanic vote. Um, so far, it doesn't seem to be working. You know, it wasn't too long ago, though, that the Republicans were doing much better with the Hispanic vote than they did in the last, uh, in the last four years. Uh, certainly, Reagan did a lot better. Even George W. Bush, which was not too long ago, got a decent number of uh, Hispanic vote, which allowed him to win the White House. And I think the lesson learned from 2008 was, unless we improve our turnout with the Hispanic vote, we're not going to win the White House again. We have seen some movement, though. Uh, I was happily surprised to see, as a result of the 2010 midterm elections, five new Republican Latinos were elected, some from very diverse states, states that you wouldn't imagine would have Latino Republicans, like Idaho or Washington State. So I think it's, you know, it's a mixed bag, and certainly there's a recognition that work needs to be done, and some of it is going on. So let me get some clarity on this. Are you saying it's a matter of turnout rather than support? I think, it's, uh, I think it's a matter of many things. I think it's a matter of message. I think it's a matter of tone. I think it's a matter of resources and turnout. Uh, you know, I think it's a matter of effective campaigning in that community. It's not, uh, it's not something that everybody gets how to do. It's important to understand, for example, with the Hispanic voters, that Hispanics are not one homogeneous group that exactly. Mexican-Americans in California or Texas might think very differently mm -hmm. from the Cuban-Americans in right. South Florida That's or right. the Puerto Ricans in Central Florida or New York. So, it, you know, it takes That's some exactly education right. to understand some of the nuances that come with the Hispanic vote. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. James, uh, I mean, this is the... Yeah, go ahead. Well, this is the... Anna is really hitting the nail right on the head here. There's a cultural competency problem. I mean, we could talk about resources and we could talk about like a genuine commitment and also we could talk about issues, but I think there's a core cultural competency challenge here that the Republican Party, as it has gotten a little bit smaller and it has gotten more homogenous over the last four or five years, has also lost its sense and its ability to connect with communities of color. And so they need strategic help 
to actually get the cultural competency necessary so that they can then know how to go out into these communities and understand the kinds of issues and the ways they need to talk about them. You can't have and talk about immigration the way the Republicans have been talking about it and expect to secure the Latino or Hispanic vote. You can't be the last politicians to talk about the Trayvon Martin case, the, the young man who was murdered in cold blood by some fake neighborhood watch person in Florida based upon a crazy law. You can't jump on that bandwagon late and then expect for the black community to come to you. So you, you've got to be competent about the cultural issues that are important to these communities. And then we can talk about the different strategies for trying to secure their votes. But if I could jump in, the previous statement, the professor uh, said that the majority of racists are Republican. There is no evidence of that, and there are many policies on the Democratic side which could be deduced to be racism in its purest form, particularly from white liberals. Uh, when it comes to outreach and getting involved in the cities, part of the Republican problem is, yeah, they're not involved in those areas, they do not go into those areas, but what's more important is that they do not have a special message for special people attitude, and that's what a lot of Republicans are worried about. Right. They just don't simply bring their basic message into the community, and even for the Latino community where I live, we have a lot of folks who are from Guatemalan descent, uh, Ecuador, et cetera, as well as uh, Puerto Ricans who originally uh, came to New Jersey when they left Puerto Rico. There are nuances between the th all different uh, parts of that community, just as uh, the African-American community. But more importantly, it's bringing the basic message like you tried to do in the last election. And when the Republican Party isn't doing that, because particularly with the African-American community, they see it as a lost cause. And for many, uh, nine out of 10 African-Americans identifying as Democrat, they hear that it's a lost cause that's when they have that self-fulfilling prophecy right. of why even try. Yeah. And I, I'd like to ask James, if you, if you allow me a question, which is, you know, you're talking about Republicans coming to the game late on this Trayvon Martin issue. But it wasn't until today that at least I heard Barack Obama talk about this, an African-American president. And yet I've never, I haven't heard anybody say that he came late to the game. Last night, Neil Gingrich was talking about oh, it. Oh, plenty. Oh, no, 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 no. Plenty, plenty of folk are saying that President Obama came late to this. They've been complaining about it for some time. But if you look at the folk who led the charge here, they're black Democrats. Reverend Al Sharpton and other Democratic leaders, even some of the Democratic senators in the state of Florida who actually voted for the Stand Your Ground laws are actually pitching in and working on the effort to try to bring justice to this case. So, you know, there have been plenty of folk complaining about the president coming late to this for sure. Um, although we can talk about that, that's, that's a little bit of a more complicated situation because the Justice Department is actually involved in now in, in the actual investigation and prosecution of the case. Um, but my point was that black Democrats will always be on those issues, for instance, like police brutality or the problems with the criminal justice system, and rarely, if ever, do we see any Republicans, black or white, on those issues. That's an important issue for African Americans. We don't see that on the platforms of Republicans, and that's why it's difficult to identify with that party. But you see, it's also difficult because, for example, if you get uh, presidential candidates talking about this issue a week ago, uh, when it happened more recently than, you know, after, more recently right. after it happened, people would criticize them for injecting politics and trying to grandstand on an issue like that, That's which is true. a very serious issue. Then right. it's a, and it's, you know, it's been also evolving. It's an issue that's been evolving. More and more facts has, have come out. More information has that's come right. out. There's now a DOJ investigation. It could involve hate crimes. That's all a very recent development. It, di it didn't happen that way. Yeah, but it was uh, sort of inevitable that it was going to be politicized at some point, wasn't it? And when it, it is going to be politicized yeah. because we're in the midst of a, of a political campaign. Yeah. And I think that... Uh, like happened today with Barack Obama, when he gets asked, he needs to have a forceful opinion. That happened last night with Newt Gingrich. And I am pretty sure that if Rick Santorum or Mitt Romney get asked, they too will have a forceful opinion. I wouldn't be advising them to stand up on a soapbox and use it as a, you know, as a, as a as political fodder. It's just not appropriate given the seriousness but, of but the situation. Look, the one thing is though, none of the Republican candidates will come out against staying your ground. None of them will go against the NRA. The NRA this has is, lobbied uh, this for is these the Florida laws that policies that in all the different states where they are. There is no Republican that will come out against them. Right. Obviously, there are plenty of black folk who are pro Second Amendment who own guns. So there's room for the Republican Party to talk to those folk. But because they tow that NRA line so strictly, they don't have a better understanding of the ways in okay, which gun James. control needs to operate in our inner cities right. and the ways in which we've got to have different kinds of policies to hedge against folk like Mr. 
Mr. Zimmerman yeah. and other citizens who are going to take vigilantism and racial profiling and combine them into this extremely combustible mix that okay. we have here with the Trayvon Martin case. Okay, James, it's a very important issue, a very important subject. I don't want to get sidetracked here. I just want to get back to Kevin. Kevin, you were saying yeah. earlier on that the Republicans sometimes face accusations of being racist. Uh, and I'm just wondering if those sentiments are sometimes reinforced, that perception is reinforced by what the candidates themselves have been saying. Now, some of the Republican presidential candidates have been accused of using racist rhetoric. Let's take a listen to what they've been saying. I don't want to, to make black people's lives better by giving them somebody else's money. I want to give them the opportunity to go out and earn the money. I would like to be the best paycheck president in American history. The African-American community should demand paychecks and not be satisfied with food stamps. I'm just wondering, you know, what are statements like that? And of course, Newt Gingrich went on to continuously call the president the food stamp president. You know. uh, to what extent does that you know, portray the Republican Party as being a party of racists? Well, it definitely reinforces a preconceived notion yeah. that's been established on some good points, yeah. uh, that the language they used uh, does sound incendiary and does sound derogatory and stereotypical. And as many people know, particularly those two gentlemen, majority of people on food stamps are actually white. Uh, in yeah. Rick Santorum's case, I think he was definitely about to slip and say the word black. Right. Which, <laughs> and it, it's amazing because he actually has done a lot for like Lincoln University and HBCU, etc. It was a bit disingenuous of him to say yeah. afterwards, I was actually going to say blah. No, <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to buy that. And also with Newt Gingrich uh, calling the, the president the food stamps president, more people have gone on food stamps than any other point in history, I think 46 million. But when you say that, you have to remember what are the ramifications of what you're saying and who's going to take your sound bite and use it against you later on. It was a very bad choice of language. What also came on later on in that statement is he talked about going to NAACP convention and talking to the group and trying to make inroads. That part exactly. never got, it got reported. And unfortunately, there's been a very antagonistic relationship between NAACP and the Republican Party historically, and that's something that should be mended. I, I know Neil Gingrich. I've spent some time with him. I know uh, Mitt Romney. I've spent some time with him. As a Hispanic, I can tell you, I don't feel for one minute that these two gentlemen have any racism in them. And I don't think it's accurate or fair to say that the Republican Party is a party of racists. I think racists no, can No, point be... taken. But why do they but, make statements like that? You know, because it's hard to talk about these issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're sensitive issues. It's hard to talk about these issues without sometimes stepping on very thin ice and, you know, misconstruing words and saying statements that can be uh, taken out of context and that can, that can be interpreted in different ways. But, you know, racists can be white, they can be black, they, they sure can, can be Hispanic, right. they can be old, they can be young, uh, well, they can I'm, be Democrats, I, I, they can on, be... Hold on, we need to slow Charles down. Barkley we need, we need said there, there are white okay, racists. Okay, James, one, and James, one moment. Race is respectful at all here. Okay. But, but Mr. Gingrich understands when he's calling this president a food stamp president, exactly the people that he's playing to in his base. He understands that that kind of racialized discourse will play well with some of his constituency. When you have uh, uh, Rick Perry with the N-word ranch and, and trying to deny that, when you have Santorum trying to deny the fact that he even said black, when you have Michelle Bachman saying that black people were better off in slavery, these things are not taken out of context. These things reflect a lack of cultural competency within the Republican Party. They may not understand the extent to which they're offending black folk, but they are offending them. They're aware of that. They're not apologizing. And sometimes they're using these things to gin up support amongst a certain small minority within the Republican Party. So I'm not calling Gingrich or Romney a racist, but they say things that are racialized and they do it deliberately sometimes. And I have not heard one apology from any Republican candidate about any of these things that they said over the course of this presidential primary season. Well, okay. I will tell you, in Gingrich's I, case, he's done tremendous uh, outreach to the Hispanic community already. I remember running into New Gingrich during the New Hampshire primary and he was having, he was holding events with Hispanics in New Hampshire. And let me tell you, it's cold in New Hampshire and there's not many Hispanics up there. Okay, well, is he being an opportunist then? Is he just talking to the audience in front of him at no, that No, he's been doing it for a long time. It's something that he was, uh, okay. it's something that he was active in in Congress. It's something that he continues to be active in. One of his best friends, in fact, one of his strongest endorsers yeah. right now is the former African-American congressman, J.C. Watts. Right, okay. Uh, Kevin, you were going to say. Yeah, I, I think one thing also with, with Speaker Gingrich and what he said, 
at a certain point, you can't take all language off the table. If you can't talk about the increase of food stamps, which has been massive, and how many more Americans are, uh, have some kind of financial connection to the federal government than do not, that has to be discussed as a major issue for this campaign. And to racialize all the language that's going to be spoken throughout the next uh, seven months, that's going to really make this an incomplete election and a dishonest election. Because if there's anything that should come out of President Obama becoming president and running for re-election, it should be that we finally have true discussions about the role of federal government, whether it's small government philosophy, which is a Republican philosophy, versus a large government, which is a, more of a Democratic liberal philosophy. Mm -hmm. By interjecting race at every turn, it's not going to be a discussion that's going to help cities so you, and you, help minorities the or anyone else. The debate's gone off track. I think it's definitely gotten off track. And okay, I think well, both sides should be careful. Uh, Republicans should be careful let, what they say be, and Democrats what they say. Let's be, let's be say. honest about something here and let's be frank. The elephant in the room is the fact that President Obama is the first African-American president. Right. And when you are dealing with uh, you know, an African-American on the other side, or when you're dealing with a Mormon, for example, yeah. there's a lot of things that are said that may not have the connotations that they do when you're, you know, when you're on the other side of the table, have somebody that it belongs to a particular group or another. And also, it's part of the reason, the fact that you know, uh, President Obama is the first African-American president, yeah. that uh, the Democratic Party right now and the Democrat Party has done so well in the last few years. It's part of the reason why he got way over 90 percent of the yeah, well, okay, uh, African-American support Let's take a look at those figures ago. now in the 2008 uh, presidential. Um, Sorry, James, I'll get to you in a moment. In that presidential election, Barack Obama won uh, without winning the majority of the white votes, actually. In fact, he only took 45 percent of the white vote compared to his Republican rival, John McCain's 50 55%, but Obama did win 67% of the Hispanic vote, and among black voters, he took, as you pointed out, 96% of the vote. Let me go to James here. James, in some respects, do the Democrats take the black vote for granted? There certainly are many instances where, where the Democratic Party takes the black vote for granted. It's kind of a double-edged sword that a lot of the issues that black folk really care about are sometimes taken up by the Democratic Party, and that builds some of the allegiance and the alliances. But I, I still, I don't think it's us or folk on the left who are racializing the political discourses. It's the folk on the right who've been doing that. And there are so many different comments and so many different situations where if you go to Governor Brewer in Arizona or just, I mean, there's so many of them, so much disrespect and so much racialized language coming from the right. It is very, very difficult for black folk to identify with a party that, that is sometimes perceived as being racist and never apologetic about it whatsoever. So it's not so much that the Democrats take the black vote for granted. It's just that black folk have found very little to identify with on the right, at least in, the, in my lifetime, right. and found a lot to be angry about in terms of some of the discourses around race and the policies that are most important to, to, to African Americans. Now, what I would say is I think there is some important or significant overlap between Republican social conservatism and those black folk who are socially conservative and more religious. But the only way to bridge that gap is for Republicans that, one, not be afraid to go into black churches. How could you have so many Republican primaries in the South and not one Republican presidential yeah, candidate visit one historically black church? I don't, I don't okay. understand how that happens. Okay. But that's the bridge by right. which you can sort of make some of these connections if you want to make inroads into the African-American voting Okay, block. Kevin, you want to respond to that? Yeah, I do. I, I would agree with him on that standpoint. The, the black churches particularly, that is an area where the Republican Party has an easy entree and natural entree. One of the things that's been interesting, Two of the uh, groups, shall we say, that are very interested in our film that we see at screenings are actually folks from the Tea Party and black Democrats live in areas that are very disaffected or unhappy with their own party. And what's interesting in discussions is that the uh, Tea Party people are very unhappy with the Republican apparatus and how they've been running the party. The folks okay. in the cities are unhappy with what they're getting from the Democrats. So when they have the conversations, they generally lean towards social conservatism, conservatism religious views. Yeah. And we've had a, gentle, a gentleman I spoke to in California. They mobilized in the African American communities and the churches to uh, vote down Prop 8. Okay, I just, they never right. came back after Prop 8 to talk to those people. Okay. Anna Navarro, I'm going to give you the last word on this. Those figures that I cited, you know, they tell a very important story here that you don't have to win the, the white vote to become president in this country. The Hispanic vote and the black vote has become very, very important. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt that, and I think it was one of the lessons learned from 2008 that uh, the Republicans, that John McCain did not win the White House because 
we lost states like Colorado, like New Mexico, like Nevada. And those are states where the Hispanic vote, that Latino vote, can make or break the difference. I do want to point out, though, mm -hmm. that amongst this, this uh, class of new freshmen that we right. have in Congress, yeah. there's a African-American Tea Party member from Florida who's in Congress. His name is Alan West. Okay. In fact, well, his name you know, is being, some, some, being yeah, named yeah, was, as a, his, is being thrown around as a possible vice presidential right. candidate. We didn't have time. One of the other things I wanted to get to is there's only two Hispanic members in the Senate. But I'm afraid Tom has caught up with us. Thanks to all of you for being with us. And that's it from the Inside Story team in Washington, D.C. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook where you can find more information about the program. And, of course, we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AlJazeera.net. Thanks for watching.